Hi, everyone, and welcome this evening. Um, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Amanda, and I am the Kibbutz Program Manager for the Kibbutz, for the OVC Kibbutz Program. Um, and hopefully this evening will give you a little bit of more insight into what Kibbutz life is all about um, and, and why you'd want to do it. Um, I also have a very special guest. Um, she is a past volunteer. She's recently returned. Her name is Nikki. And we'll be chatting to her a little bit later on in the presentation just um, about her experience and what she learned from the program. So I think um, just a little bit of housekeeping. I'm just going to keep everyone's cameras off and um, everyone muted. And then at the end, if anyone's got any questions, you're welcome to either pop them in the chat box or unmute yourself, put your cameras on and ask any questions. So I think let's um, let's start the presentation with, uh, if, if none of you know where Israel is, um, there is pretty much a, a, a little map there with regards to, um, can uh, I don't, can everyone hear? I, I've just got someone who said that they are unable to hear. I think uh, if Janine and Sydney Yes, we can hear. Okay, 100%. Okay, thanks. Um, so just with regards to where Israel is, um, it's pretty much surrounded by the Mediterranean and the Red Seas. There is Egypt, there's Jordan, there's Syria, um, and there is also Palestine as well. Um, it is a very, very small country. However, don't let that fool you. There is tons of action, lots of things to do. There's mountains, there is uh, beaches, there are, um, there, it, I think in the mountains they even get snow. There is really a lot of things to do in such a small space. Um, it is really quite an interesting country in the sense that um, it. I think Israel, pretty much everyone thinks of it as one big desert, um, but it's probably the only country in the world in the last 50 years to have grown the most trees. So that's quite an interesting fun fact. Um, it's also a very high tech country. There are a lot of inventors. There's a lot of um, developers that come from Israel. Um, so don't let that fool you. Um, I think the biggest question on this program that OBC cons consultants get is what is a kibbutz? Um, and after what is a kibbutz is why would you do a, a kibbutz? And a kibbutz is actually quite a hard concept to be able to put into words. It really is something that you have to experience. Um, but for tonight, for the sake of obviously this presentation and uh, to do what we do, um, if you wanted like a formal explanation, it's pretty much a collective community that is obviously based in Israel. It's unique to Israel, so you're not going to find a kibbutz anywhere else in the world where everybody lives and works and contributes to the running of this communal space. So it is a Hebrew word, which means collective or group. And if you wanted a South African, um, con for me to put it into a South African context, it's almost like a housing estate with either like a working farm or like a B and B on it. Um, so it is something where everyone lives. There's either sometimes a small kindergarten, there's a swimming pool, there's one big main dining hall, uh, hall and there's various different sectors. A lot of kibbutz um, do things such as um, in terms of to bring an in income. Um, I see the of my earphones. I don't know if that's going to make any difference. Um, so hopefully that that helps. Um, but with regards to what a kibbutz does in terms of bringing in income, a lot of them are mainly agricultural. So they might have cattle, they could have um, a cotton field, they could produce uh, or have orchards in terms of like fruit, uh, fruit farming, they could have cotton fields. Um, some of them also um, derive their income from tourism, uh, where they might have a and b or they might have uh, offer guided tours in a particular popular area. So it really just depends. And as a volunteer, you would then go and volunteer your time and your services and pretty much your muscle because most of the work that you're going to be doing is going to be manual work. Um, and in exchange, you'll be given obviously this unique and uh, original experience where people and volunteers from all over the world come together as a collective source to do the same thing that you're going to be doing. So it's kind of like all four corners in one little tiny space. Um, and you'll be obviously working on the kibbutz next to what we call kibbutzniks, which are people who live and work on the kibbutz. 
um, who pretty much own a part of the kibbutz. And um, it really is just a fabulous experience. Moving on to um, our next slide is um, our partner. So we're not just going to kind of like get you to Israel and be like, whoops, there you go, good luck. Um, we have our partner, which is uh, KPC, and they are there to be able to look, look after you in Israel. Uh, their office is in Tel Aviv, um, and they are pretty much uh, contactable pretty much all the time. Um, you are looking at a generally a pre-placement on a kibbutz, especially now with COVID. Um, a lot of the placements will be done um, before you go, so you'll know exactly where you're going to be going. You'll given, be given a short orientation as well. And all the locations in terms of where the kibbutz are, are screened. So if there is a particular area that, have probably, that may have some trouble, obviously you're not going to be sent there unless you would want to for some reason. Um, there's generally a volunteer leader that looks after you on the kibbutz as well. So if you have any issues or... Um, you have a favor to ask or anything along those lines, there's somebody there that kind of you can go to and, and he or she would, uh, would kind of lead you in terms of, of which way to go. And KPC is pretty much there for support and guidance. They are really, um, I, I feel that they're, they're pretty much going to be like a part of your family on that side. They really, can, they really do look after you and they really do have the um, volunteers' interest um, in terms uh, to their, in their best heart. Um, with regards to eligibility, it is quite um, a very easy eligibility in terms of making sure that you are eligible to um, uh, uh, apply on the program. You pretty much need to be between the ages of 18 to 35. Males and females can apply, um, South African or EU passports you would need to be medically fit. So just remember that mentally you'd need, you'd need to be, have like a, you'd need to have a medical certificate where you are deemed fit mentally as well as physically. You'd also need to have an HIV certificate. And um, in terms of COVID and where we are, whilst at the moment there is a travel ban, so we aren't able to travel to Israel, but you either need to be vaccinated or be willing to be vaccinated. So just to keep that in mind so that when it is time to travel, um, you can't also be half vaccinated, so to speak. So you'd need to make sure that you are completely and fully vaccinated or either not vaccinated. And if when you do travel to Israel, your vaccination will be done um, pretty much within your first, I would say, couple of months of arriving. And I think probably the most important thing about the eligibility of the program is being reminded that you are going to be with people um, and everything is pretty much a shared and communal space. So you have to be fairly open-minded. You have to really like people. You have to um, be willing to, um, you know, obviously learn about other cultures and and just have a pretty much of an open mind. If people frustrate you and they irritate you and you like your alone time, then you might want to like second guess in terms of is this going, program going to be the right program for you. And then um, I think the next biggest question is um, what do you do on a kibbutz? So this is where I would actually like to uh, call upon Nikki. Um, she is a past volunteer who came, um, I think she left, to go to Israel October 2019. And um, Nikki, if you don't mind just maybe putting on your camera, there you go, let's, let's wait for Nikki to, to come online. There we go. Hi. Nice <laughs> to see you again. <laughs> yes, nice to see you. <laughs> so Nikki was actually a volunteer that my office sent way back in 2019. Um, and I think, how old were you Nikki when you left? You were 19. Yes, yes. <laughs> 19, and I actually found the picture the other day of when of what we took outside our office um, of you just a few days before you were leaving. Um, so I can only imagine what was going through your mind at that stage. I think you were not really knowing what to expect. No, um, not at all. <laughs> but maybe if you could give us a little bit of, of your, uh, or tell us a little bit about your experience. What, um, first of all, what made you want to do the kibbutz program? Was there anything in particular? Um, well, I didn't really qualify for any of the other GAP programs, <laughs> so, but my uncle did it like many years ago, 
and he told me like it's gonna be such a good experience and I was like working on a farm really and so but I wanted to do something that I could live in a different country not just travel and so I was like okay it sounds interesting why not <laughs> Yes. And, and when you left, you obviously things were a little bit different then because that was just before COVID uh, hit. Yes. Uh, which kibbutz did you go to? And uh, roughly how many volunteers were there? And do you, like, were they from all over the world or were they like from like maybe two or three countries? So I really wanted to work outside. And when I got to the KPC office in um, Tel Aviv, I told them like, please, please, please let me work outside. And so the only kibbutz that was available at the time um, that would allow me to work outside was Kibbutz Baram. And it's in like the north of Israel on the very border. Like I could see Lebanon from my room window. So it was pretty, pretty much on the border. And um, it was also the kibbutz with the most volunteers. Um, we were about 40 at a time, which is quite a lot. Because um, a lot of the other kibbutzims have like 10 or 11 volunteers at a time. So I was very overwhelmed at the beginning. I was like, whoa, this is so many people. And like, you're with people constantly. So initially, it was socially really draining. I was very overwhelmed. But you get used to it. And now I'm like, I don't have enough people around me. <laughs> um, but yes, and there were volunteers from all over the world like literally everywhere like I couldn't believe that I met so many international people on such a small little place in the middle of nowhere <laughs> so yes and what like when you first arrived on Kibbutz Baram what what jobs did you did you have one particular job that you did for the entire time because you if I stand to be corrected if I mean I know I did your ticket for you when you came back but I can't actually really remember it was a bit of a blur because we had so many time changes but you came back October right last year so uh, November, November November okay so you were there just for over a year did you do one job for the entire time that you were there or did you have different jobs that you did um no so I got there and then obviously I told the volunteer leader like hey I want to work outside and he was like yeah hold it right there everyone <laughs> wants to work outside <laughs> so um so initially I started off working in the apple factory because our kibbutz um specialized in fruit and so I worked in the apple factory for about two months and then I was like yes I'm finally being upgraded to outside and then I actually just moved to the mega, like the medical factory where I did a lot of like general tasks for the medical factory and cleaning, a lot of cleaning. So it wasn't, that was definitely not my favorite part, but it's fun if you have fun people working with you. Um, so it, it is nice if you make it nice for yourself. Um, and then eventually I moved outside to the orchards, which was my absolute favorite part. I worked in the orchards for eight months and it was like working outside every day and it was amazing. So yes, and, but there were a lot of other jobs um, in the dining room or in the laundry room or um, even some people that could speak Hebrew even worked in the kindergarten. So it really depends on your skills as well. Okay. Okay. And um, in terms of like going back to the, the orchards, um, like what exactly did you do? Was it, would you say it was incredibly physical or, you know, were you able to deal with it? Was it, was it not so bad? Because I think a lot of people think like, oh my God, I'm going to be doing, you know, manual labor. Um, yeah. And they, they're, they think that they're going to be working like 60 hours a week and like, you know, <laughs> building muscles of steel, but it's, it's, well, from my experience, it wasn't so bad. What was your experience? No. No, I think you should be prepared to be sweaty and to get dirty and to get your hands dirty because um, we did a lot of different things. Um, we pulled weeds sometimes, which is obviously, it can be physical, but it's not like you need to be strong. You know, you just need to be willing to sweat. <laughs> um, and, but then some days were also really chilled where we were just hanging fly traps on the trees to make sure to prepare for summer um, some days we picked fruit some days we pruned trees um, so it really depends um, 
it, but I wouldn't say you need to be a bodybuilder, no. <laughs> <laughs> and um, how many, do you, can you remember maybe roughly how many hours per week you would work? Um, I'd say we, we started in the morning fairly early, uh, especially outside. We sometimes started at 5.30, yeah. um, but then we would be done by like 1, 2 p.m. Okay. So it's like an eight hour work day with a lunch and a breakfast in between. Okay. So, it's roughly seven, seven, eight hours. And then let's talk about free time. So um, did you have free time? Like what did you do after you were done at like one o'clock? Uh, and what could you do on the kibbutz? Um, so because we were so many people, there was never a dull moment. Like <laughs> there was always something going on. Um, yes, we were like in the summer, it was obviously much nicer because everyone was outside in the courtyard like playing chess, playing music, chilling, um, or cooking, or there was, yeah, there was like, it really depends also because we were such a big group. There were like little groups, like doing things together after work. So you had the people that love to just chill and sit in a corner somewhere. And then like me and my roommate were very active. So we would go hike to a nearby river or gather some other people and go, read in the forest or it really depends um but there were also like some people on the kibbutz that gave dance lessons or yoga so we would tune into that there was also a gym on the kibbutz which was great like a little gym so at night like all the gym people would go gym um so yeah so and also if you do feel like you need some alone time there is more than enough time to put an hour of the day out for yourself and go somewhere like the kibbutz is fairly big or the one where I was so I always found a little corner just to make time for myself because I felt like I needed it um so there's really there's lots there's lots to do um we played basketball we would gather people to play football so it really depends on the people you're with as well but if you're a good group you find things to entertain yourself so awesome. yeah and did you feel safe whilst you were like on the kibbutz and outside of the kibbutz was there any moments where you like feared for your life or anything along those lines <laughs> <laughs> um there were some dramatic moments where we, there were like flares going off and things but it was only because we were on the border and they patrolled the area a lot but i never felt unsafe there's like a thousand bunkers on the kibbutz as well um which we used to party, but <laughs> um, so it was like going down into the underworld and it was very fun, um, but I never felt unsafe. I, in fact, I think I felt much safer in Israel than I've ever felt in South Africa. So yes. Yeah, no, I can relate to that. And um, with regards to like your living arrangements, um, how like did you sh you mentioned your roommates was it only you and somebody else that you shared a room with um and did you have like a, a your own bathroom or did you guys have to is it like hostel type did you have to share um it's very much hostel vibes um but there's never more than two people in a room where i was so um there's basically there were like the corridors were separated and there were four rooms in a corridor so the people in that corridor had two bathrooms to share. So it was normally four people, four people per bathroom, which is not too bad. Okay. So it's pretty much like a hostel, um, but the rooms were spacious. It was, it was really nice. And a lot of the old volunteers leave things behind and we decorate our rooms with all the stuff we find around, or you add something to the wall, make your own little contribution. So it, it's really nice. It's not, it's not bad. Okay, cool. And I see that the bottom two photos are in your room. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Okay. And the top photo on the screen, the top left hand side, is that in the volunteer uh, kitchen or dorms or where you guys obviously had a meal? Um, so when lockdown came, uh -huh. um, our, um, like our hall, our, our eating hall, is that yeah. what it's called? Yeah. Yeah. Dining yeah. room, our yeah. dining room. Um, closed. and so we had to cook for ourselves for a few months and so we had to move everything into our little volunteer building so that's actually in the laundry room um <laughs> so that's why there's like clothes in, in on the sides but um so 
Wait, what was your question again? <laughs> well, I just wanted to know, like, in terms of, like, uh, if, if that was, like, your volunteer dining room and... Um, oh, and okay, yes. Yeah. So, no, um, no, that's just us having Shabbat dinner. So, Shabbat, I'm sure you will learn more about it, but it's, like, the, the meal of the week when we have the best food. And so, we would all gather together for on Fridays with wine and food and, like, baked bread and then have a Shabbat meal. So that's what's happening over there. Yeah, I always kind of um, uh, describe it as like a Sunday roast type of, yes. type of vibe. A, fam it's a, a Sunday sit down meal, yeah. And um, uh, just let's chat about the food quickly. What was your experience with, with the food? Was it, um, you know, fresh and healthy or, you know, like, was it really like, you know, how, how was it? What, what was your take on Israeli food? Okay, it's the best food you will ever have. <laughs> I, I went there in shape and I came back with a lot of weight. So <laughs> I ate so much. Um, the dining room was phenomenal. Like our dining room was, it was like a buffet um, every day. And there were so many options. Like I'm vegetarian, but there was always something to eat. And sometimes even choices. Like there wasn't only one meal for vegetarians. And sometimes they even serve vegan food, which was quite surprising. So there's so many salads to choose from. There's so many meats and there's always vegetables. There's always fresh things. So um, I don't think food was a problem at all. It was really good. Yeah, I know. Huge thumbs up from my side as well. And um, so obviously on the program, in, in case you guys didn't know, as a volunteer, you do get time off when you obviously can then leave the kibbutz and go on excursions. Also, your kibbutz, um, once you've been there for a certain time period, generally organizes like an excursion for all the volunteers where they'll take you to a place. So um, let's chat about where you went. Um, so outside of the kibbutz, what, what, you know, where did you go um, to and travel around Israel? Was it easy to be able to do? Um, did you ever go alone? Did you go always go with a group of people? What, what like maybe chat about us, uh, chat to us with regards to like some of your experiences of where you went? Sure. Um, so firstly, I'm very independent. Um, so I love to just like I won't wait for people. I'm like, okay, if I want to go somewhere, I will go, um, whether you come with me or not. Um, so I traveled alone quite a bit um, so you gather off days so every month you get one free day and sometimes if you work over the weekends you can gain an extra free day and you can accumulate them and then maybe take a week or for however long um, and then I would use that time like I would accumulate a few days and then take the bus from the kibbutz it goes directly from the kibbutz to um, a bus like a bus station stop Yes, bus station nearby. Um, and then I would take a bus from there to wherever. So you can definitely travel by yourself. It's really safe. Um, I had this app on my phone. I can't even remember the name anymore, but it's really well known. Um, I can't remember the name. I'm very sorry. <laughs> okay, but it was okay. excellent. Like it would plan out your whole little trip for you and tell you where to get on what bus and which connection to find where. Like it was really, 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 really helpful. Like I would get so lost without it, um, especially because um, a lot of the road signs and everything is in Hebrew. So you can't read. <laughs> so having Google Maps with you is, is really helpful. Um, so yeah, um, I traveled alone a bit and it's really fun to go alone as well because I ended up on a complete Arab boat and I was the only non-Arab person on this Arab boat and the people were like so fascinated with the foreigners. So it was so fun. And I think where as if I was not alone, I would not have gone on a boat. And so I really would encourage you to at least take one trip by yourself and try and figure it out yourself. Push yourself out of your comfort zone. Um, but then further, what we also did a lot is like we would um, take like four or five people of us would plan a date together and then hire an Airbnb in Tel Aviv or one of the other cities. And then we will go and we will all chip in a bit of money and stay in an Airbnb, which is much nicer than a hostel because yeah. you have like privacy and you have sometimes have a balcony and it's just much nicer that way. So I would say get yourself a group of friends and do that. 
because the volunteer trips aren't very regular. It's normally once every three months for us. Um, but the, the volunteer trips were phenomenal. Like we would all get in a bus super early one morning and we would normally go away for like two, two to three days, um, two to four days sometimes. Um, so yeah, we went everywhere on volunteer trips from um, Jerusalem to the Sea of Galilee, all the way down to, no, I'm starting to forget the place's names. <laughs> you must um, have gone to maybe um, Masada, a lot. Yes, yes, a lot. Like we went everywhere on volunteer trips and it's amazing because they pay for everything. They organize everything. So it's kind of more of like a tour and there's normally a tour guide also on the bus. So it's very organized and kind of more like the traditional see Israel in three days kind of thing. Okay. Um, yes, so and, uh, really nice. And, and um, so there's obviously tons to see because, well, I know that, um, but you know, people just think of Israel as like, I know that when I first left, I, I had this vision in my head that, you know, it was gonna be rocks and sand and- Yes, and yes. But it's really <laughs> quite, it's quite diverse. And Tel Aviv is very. just mind blowing in the sense of, um, the fashion and it's very European oh, style with yeah, the little oh, cafes. It's, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. There's so much to see. Um, but I think lastly, just to uh, kind of like end off, um, in terms of keeping in touch with you know your family and your friends back home, I think a lot of people are scared that they are going to go into kibbutz and kind of like almost disappear into a, like a black hole because you know they won't be Wi-Fi and how they're going to get in touch with their mom and their dad and you know chat to their friends and lose touch but I mean obviously we know it's, it's not like that I mean what what was your um like I mean you were talking about using an app when you were you know going from from the on the bus um transport system so I mean is it quite was it quite easy for you to be able to keep in touch with your with your folks at home and friends yes it was it, no it was like normal life it wasn't um, we had Wi-Fi on the kibbutz, but the Wi-Fi was never very good. So what most of us had, like our volunteer leader organized SIM cards for all of us. And the data in Israel is so cheap. Like we had unlimited data for like something like 30 shekels a month, which is it's, it's nothing. Um, and so my data was constantly on and like. I use that to communicate with my family. It's just like life here. It's really, it sounds much more dramatic than it is. It's really, really no problem at all. Okay, awesome. And my final last question is um, just from your experience, would you ever go back? And if you had to do it all over again, would you? Oh my gosh, it was, I, I'm not biased or anything. <laughs> but it was the best experience I've ever had. I would 100% recommend it to anyone. Um, it's the best gap year program there is. I swear I did au pairing as well. Au pairing cannot compare to this. Like you meet so many people, you you have so much fun. Like it's, it's like a holiday. It's like living the university life without the responsibility of any work so um like i would tell you to do it 100 percent, and i plan on going back and doing it again after my studies like 100 percent. it's amazing it's life-changing oh. and you should do it <laughs> yes. that's awesome thank you so much nikki i really appreciate it if you can but no pressure if you are able maybe just to hang on so the last couple of slides, maybe someone's got a question that's particularly directed at yourself, but you don't have to if you need to go and eat stuff. Chill it or you just going to ignore it? It's divided into two and chill for 60 minutes. Ah, uh, Trish, I can hear you. Hold on one sec. Okay, there you go. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just turn your uh, camera off for now. Um, so there you have it. So that was pretty much Nikki's experience of her time on a kibbutz. Um, and I would just pretty much like to almost finish off by telling you what the benefits and the inclusions are of the program. So you are going to be living um, on the kibbutz itself. So your housing and your meals are all taken care of. Your meals, you'll get three meals a day. So your breakfast, your lunch, and your dinner. You'll also be earning what we call a stipend, which is just another word for pocket money. So you generally would earn roughly about 550 shekels which is probably about 
um, 2,500 rand, somewhere around there. Um, and that will be enough. I mean, obviously bearing in mind that you've got no expenses whatsoever, maybe buying some data. Um, there's normally a little shop on the kibbutz as well. So if you need to buy toothpaste or shampoo um, before, you know, without maybe going into town, etc. But it's more than enough money to be able to, to do that and even a couple of drinks at the pub. Um, obviously, in terms of benefits, you are going to be uh, gaining a lot of work experience and different types of work experience, which I think, you know, will also help benefit you maybe in terms of later on in life, um, you might meet people, you might uh, find an interest um, in some field that you never thought was even imaginable. Um, you are also given medical insurance. So when you go onto the program, part of your fees includes medical insurance. So just in case something happens to you, medically wise, you are covered. And like Nikki mentioned, you also have those sponsored excursions where the kibbutz pretty much takes you on an excursion to a um, tourism a tur a tourist um, destination within Israel, and they pretty much cover all the all the costs of that. And you'll have quite a bit of free time, um, so you'll have more than enough time to be able to, you know, do your own thing in terms of having your own me time, maybe going to the nearest town, or um, obviously also. Um, during um, your days off, et cetera, like Nikki also said, you could bank them um, and, and kind of like build them up and then take like a, a longish kind of holiday. And I think for me, the biggest benefit of this program is that you only really need to be able to commit for a minimum of two months. Um, you can stay a maximum of 12 months. And I think a lot of, um, when people hear that a commitment of a program is 12 months, it can sometimes scare you quite a bit. But the nice thing about this program is that you just have to commit for a minimum of two months and then maximum stay of, of 12 months. So if you're in Israel um, or you, 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 or let's say you go to Israel with the option of, of thinking that I'm just going to go there for two months, you can then extend whilst you are uh, in Israel and decide and pretty much do it um, as you feel fit. In terms of um, COVID, um, like I mentioned before, there obviously is a travel ban. So unfortunately, we aren't able to travel from South Africa at this moment in time. And um, just to bear in mind that obviously the, the steps and the protocols change on a daily basis, almost so it seems. But just to kind of give you an idea in terms of how things would, what the process would be and how things would follow through, you would pretty much um, apply with OVC, you pay an application fee and you'd get all your application documents together. Our partner does a pre-screen, so it's almost like a pre-interview with you where they chat to you, they make sure that you are a volunteer type and that you are obviously understand what the program is all about. And they also try and get to know a little bit more about you so that they can place you on the right kibbutz because it's important that you're happy because if you're happy, then you're going to obviously work harder and um, have a great time, which will just have a, a ripple effect on everyone else on the kibbutz. Your visa application is a twofold process. It's, it's roughly done about four weeks prior to departure um, or prior to your arrival in Israel. It's first applied for within Israel. And then once it's been approved in Israel, you would then apply for the actual visa entry clearance through the embassy here in Pretoria. Then you would then obviously book your ticket. You would need a PCR test 72 hours prior to travel. You would travel to Israel. And then once you arrive, there's actually a kibbutz representative who would then come and pick you up from the airport. Um, but before you have that pickup, sorry, one uh, things change all the time, but you actually also need to have a PCR test that's done on arrival. That'll be done at uh, ben Gurion at airport. Um, then you'll obviously be picked up, you'll be taken directly to the kibbutz because you would have been pre-placed so you'll know exactly where you're going to be going. Um, and then as soon as you arrive on the kibbutz, you'll have to do a 10-day quarantine. On your last day of quarantining, you'd be tested again. Obviously, once you're negative, you would then go um, uh, be able to start volunteering. So um, it is quite a process. Um, and I do think that probably things may change as we go along, but that is what it is at this moment in time. So I just wanted to give you guys some kind of a guideline in terms of, you know, how things would work. Um, and then once you start volunteering, like I said, it's just a minimum commitment of two months, maximum commitment of 12 months. And all cost in, um, 
uh, the cost of the program for everything you're looking at is probably approximately 35,000 Rand. So that is pretty much inclusive of everything except your spending money. Um, that includes your um, application fee, it includes your KPC fees, it includes your medical insurance, it includes your travel insurance if you want to take additional travel insurance that will include an air ticket as well from South Africa to Israel. It will, I've also added in like the PCR test, it includes the pickup as well as the accommodation, the quarantine accommodation cost for the, for the 10 days that you have to quarantine. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. It's a, it's, it's really quite affordable if you consider that you're going to be, or if you can uh, spend up to 12 months within Israel itself. Um, and um, sorry, whoops, that's, that's pretty much um, everything about the kibbutz program for now. I don't know if anyone's got any questions. Maybe you'd like to either direct them at myself or direct them to Nikki. Um, yeah, um, let's have a look at the chat box quickly. Okay, um, how long do people stay on average? Um, so, um, Yvette, it's actually quite a, um, I'm actually quite proud to be able to answer that because most of my clients who go over normally say, when I ask them, okay, you know, roughly how long are you thinking of staying? So, I think when you first go, when you first start your application, most people generally say about two to three months. And I can say that almost, 95% of people, probably even more than that, end up extending. Um, and I would say on average, people stay anything from six to 12 months. Um, so yeah, so that just kind of like gives you an idea in terms of, of how long people stay. But it's really up to you. Um, you know, it obviously also depends on what you've got when you come back, um, etc. Um, does all this information apply to Kibbutzi? I don't know how to pronounce that, but um, it, it it just depends. Uh, we'd need to check. I don't I don't recognize that kibbutz name, but it's obviously things have changed. Um, so what I'd need to do is maybe just check with our partner if that kibbutz actually um, has a uh, if if they take volunteers. So if you want to, um, you can uh, contact your nearest OVC and we can investigate that for you. Um, there's no set intake date. You can pretty much go throughout the year. Obviously, now we can't go at all because of the travel ban. But you know, you can you pretty much set your date in terms of when you would like to arrive. Um, applying on ovc.com. Um, it's ovc.coza, but the best thing to do, Naila, would be to contact your OVC consultant, um, and then they would then be able to send you the the necessary steps as an online application. And then once you've done that, you pay your application fee and then you'd need to start getting all your paper documents together. Um, but it's pretty easy, to be honest. Um, what exactly must you take when you, with you when you go? Um, uh, Samuel, do you mean in terms of documents or do you mean just in terms of like um, clothes and things like that? Do you want to maybe unmute yourself? Documents. Okay, well, documents, um, when you submit your application, you're going to need to submit an application form. You'd need to submit an HIV certificate, a copy of your passport. Um, you'd need to include a doctor's certificate. There's a, a template that we would then give you that you'll take to your doctor that he or she would complete. And um, there's a couple of um, forms that you need to complete from the Ministry of Interior. Um, but that's pretty much it. It's really quite easy and quite straightforward. You need a police clearance as well. Um, and don't bother with going with the with the SAPS. We can get you um, uh, uh, in contact with a company who manages to organize uh, uh, what we call a short version police clearance. Um, and it's very quick and very painless. So it's quite an easy, straightforward process. As long as you've done your research and you feel that you um, understand and you kind of manage your expectations in terms of what the kibbutz program is all about, um, then I'm sure it will be fine. If you don't have a passport, um, just go to Home Affairs. I think they should be open now to be able to apply for one um, and it should be fairly quickly as well. But just Samuel, going back to your question about what do you need to take, um, a lot of people ask that question in terms of like physically what do you need to take when you go there, I would always say that um, 
you want to take clothes for pretty much any season. Um, remember also bearing in mind that Israel's seasons are the opposite of us. So our winter is their summer. Obviously, it gets really, really hot. So you want to take lots of uh, sunscreen, um, a really good hat, and to keep the sun out, and good boots, if you ask me, um, and mo muddy repellent. Um, that will probably pretty much be my top three or four on my list. Um, you don't really have to worry about working clothes um, because a lot of the kibbutz um, have like clothes that they'll give you, uh, you know, like not a uniform, or more like an overall or uh, t-shirts and pants to be able to work in so you don't have to actually ruin your own clothes as well. Um, and um, I see there's a, somebody from the Ivory Coast. Unfortunately, though, we aren't able to send anyone from the Ivory Coast. Um, it is only South Africans and EU passport holders. It's not our decision, unfortunately. It is um, the the decision of, of Israel itself. Um, but yeah, I don't know if anybody else has any questions with regards to the program. Um, I think if you do, probably the best thing to do would be to get in touch with your OVC consultant. They would be able to chat to you and, and go through go through the next steps. Will there be any help when we arrive at the airport? Yes, there'll be somebody who's going to be picking you up at the airport. Um, so there's actually a kibbutz representative. So someone will be sent from the kibbutz to come and pick you up. So there'll most likely be somebody with your name on a piece of cardboard um, that will then come and pick you up and then obviously then take you directly to the kibbutz. So you won't have to worry about catching a bus or catching a train or anything along those lines, um, which I think kind of takes the sting out of it all. Back in my day when we did it, we had to get ourselves, and I know Nikki also had to do it, uh, you had to get yourself from the airport to the KPC office in Tel Aviv. But luckily now with COVID, there are some, there's some blessings involved where you can actually, um, uh, where, where things like this help and, and become advantageous. Um, Religion-wise, that's actually a really good question. Do you need to be Muslim or I'm assuming the question must be Jewish? No, you can be any religion. You can have no religion. There's nobody who's going to hit you over the head with the Quran or hit you over the head with the Bible or anything like that. Everyone um, is very, um, I would say, respectful of, of each other's uh, religions. Um, how much Hebrew do you think you should understand when you arrive? Um, I arrived knowing absolutely zilch. I think I knew shalom, and that was about it. Um, but um, I think you'll probably pick up quite, if you want to, if you have the initiative and you have the interest, you'll probably pick up quite a bit, especially if you're going to be working with a lot of other kibbutzniks as well. Um, and if you go traveling quite a bit, it comes in quite handy to be able to ask um, the basic things and the basic questions. It's a, it's, it's quite an interesting language. It's really difficult to learn how to read and write it, but to be able to speak it, it, it kind of reminds me of Afrikaans with all the chuz in it, but um, uh, you'll, you should be able to pick it up quite easily. Um, can a granny go? I don't know what you mean by a granny, but if you, it's basically the age limit is 18 to 35. Sometimes we can push somebody who's slightly older, really just depends on the motivation, um, but um, uh, yeah, it, it, it would obviously, you'd need to chat to your office and we can go from there. Um, so yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Um, I'd just like to say thank you very much for um, attending tonight. I hope you've learned something. I hope it was inspiring. I hope um, by chatting to Nikki, um, you know, it, it's helped you uh, learn a lot more in terms of, of what it's all about. And um, we hope to see your application soon. So thank you so much and have a good evening. Take care and um, hopefully we'll see you soon. Cheers.